Life is a collection of memories and experiences that help define who we are as human beings. Our brain stores this precious cargo. Our brain keeps us functioning. It is responsible for every breath we take, every word we speak. But for millions of people, diseases of the brain like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's rob memories, health, and often their very lives. Today, Las Vegas, Nevada is becoming a modern medical destination, fighting against these terrible diseases. A cutting edge brain health facility is attracting experts, medical professionals, and patients seeking life-saving solutions. All thanks to a monumental effort that began with an ailing Las Vegas icon and his adoring son. It began with the power of love. This documentary is made possible by these supporters. Erwin Kishner, whose impact on public service television and brain-related research will never be forgotten. The Lynn Ruffin Smith Charitable Foundation is proud to support resources available for care providers and patients suffering from neurological diseases. Martin A. Gold, who has a continuing desire to increase community awareness of the progress in medical research. The story of how Las Vegas became one of the world's leading centers of brain health is really the story of one man, Lou Ruvo, and a restaurant. Born in Niagara Falls, New York in 1922, Lou Ruvo got his start in tourism running a limo business and sightseeing tours of the falls. It was during this time that Lou Ruvo met Angie Markison, and soon the two started dating. However, it wasn't long before World War II intervened and Lou heard the call of service. Somewhere in the South Pacific, American fighting men smashing their way ashore against resistance. Angie, I'm going off to war. I don't want to leave anybody behind. Not sure how long I'll be, how long this war is going to last, but uh, I'm in the Army Air Force, and we're, we're breaking up. My mother was devastated called her sister. My sister says, don't worry, sis, come out here to where we live in Las Vegas and you'll spend time with us. And my mother got on a train and five or six days later winds up in Las Vegas. As luck or fate would have it, Lou ended up being stationed just outside of Vegas at McCarran Field. It was there that he underwent training to be an aerial gunner prior to shipping out to the Pacific. One night, Lou and a group of fellow trainees were at a dance club on Fremont Street, and what started over 2,000 miles away in New York reignited in the Nevada desert. My mom walked in, saw my father, and that was it. It was, it was, it was over. The, the, they've never left each other's side. After the war, Lou and Angie returned to Niagara Falls, married, and in 1946, the couple gave birth to their only son, Larry. Eventually, the family moved back to Las Vegas. At the time, it was a dusty little town just getting its start as a place where you could come and gamble your troubles away. In a town so small, Lou Ruvo sensed an opportunity. I'm a young man, uh, seven years old, and I remember my father coming in. We all lived in one little house we were staying with, my Aunt Mary, and, and she had one daughter, my, my cousin Lorraine, and they said, my dad said, well, we rented a restaurant today. And my mother and my aunt said, what? What do you mean you rented a restaurant? Are we having a party? What do you, why would you rent a restaurant? No, no, we rented a, a, a retail space and we're gonna put a restaurant in. And my aunt and my mother to my uncle and my dad said, what do we know about a restaurant? And my father said, and my uncle said, everybody that comes here loves both of your food. Nobody doesn't love your food. We, we know you know how to cook, and Al knows how to tend bar, and I'm gonna run the front of the house. Both Lou and Angie could trace their roots to the Treviso region of Italy and name their new restaurant, The Venetian. 
The small eatery soon became the talk of a growing Vegas and was known not only for its cooking, but for its close family atmosphere. Well, we lived in the neighborhood where the Venetian was located and uh, the Venetian was the Italian restaurant in the entire community. It was a different town in those days. Uh, we didn't have the wonderful buffets and the, uh, the great restaurants and the great chefs, and that filled its place. But it, it was a very special kind of uh, restaurant. They were so friendly. They knew everyone. The staff knew everyone. It was first name basis. They were able to do that because the size was relatively small. There are very few places in Las Vegas where you could go into today and be greeted by name. They made you feel important. I mean, here I was, a young lawyer, just starting in town, and it was Mr. Goodman, and it was Oscar, and Mrs. Goodman, and it was Carolyn, and the four little Goodmans, and they knew each one of them. They knew what they liked to eat, what they liked to drink, and it, it was special. They, it's, it doesn't exist anymore. There's no place like that. Maybe for a high roller, maybe in a special room, but everybody was treated that way at the Venetian. Before long, the Venetian became known as the place to eat in Las Vegas. And for a town that would eventually become known for Wolfgang Puck and Gordon Ramsay, Angie Ruvo was Vegas's first celebrity chef. As the Venetian's notoriety grew, it wasn't uncommon to see some of the who's who of Las Vegas at the tables with everyday folks. Despite the family atmosphere, not all of the patrons were folks the Ruvos wanted in the Venetian. In those days, back in the 50s and 60s, Vegas's reputation as a gambling getaway where anything goes tended to attract a certain kind of person. There were three or four guys who started to frequent the restaurant. They were not Las Vegas's most upright citizens. And they began making the place kind of their hangout. They'd come in for dinner and then start to use it as an office. Louis went over to their table one night and said, get out, don't come back. For Larry Ruvo, the Venetian wasn't just a place to eat or the place where his parents worked. It soon became a second home and a place where he would spend his formative years learning valuable lessons from his father about business and life. I was now 14 years old. I had worked there from the time I was seven. And at 14, I figured I knew everything. So uh, at 14, one Friday, I went in and the chef was not, it was very hot and I saw him drinking a beer before the shift. So I fired him. And my father comes to work and he said, uh, you fired John Kirk, the chef? And I said, yeah, dad, you know, he was, it was he was drinking before the shift, and he says, well, first of all, you never fire a chef on a Friday. Wait till Monday. We need him, it's a busy weekend. When Lou came to the restaurant that afternoon, he found out what Larry did. He rehired the chef and promoted him, and his first instructions were to fire Larry. So we sat down, and my dad said, uh, Larry's got something to say. I said, John, I need you back. I made a mistake. Uh, I didn't have the authority, which I didn't. And my father said, great, this is all settled. Yes, he says, well, John, immediately I'm making you general manager and your first job is to fire my son. And I never worked for my father again. He went to work at the Sahara, where one of my brothers was, was involved working in their kitchen, bussing dishes, bussing tables, stuff like that. So that's another side of Lou. He, he was strict, but uh, you just have to admire the guy. And I remember for many reasons, because I was 14 years old, I was saving for a car. So that threatened my ability to have some mobility in, in a very, about a year and a half. And, uh, but I learned a life's lesson that time with my dad. The Ruvos, Lou and Angie, treated their employees like family. And they respected one another. Larry got out of hand, uh, did something he shouldn't have done. The cook that I'm referring to was the husband of one of the waitresses. And Lou, the lesson was, you don't treat people that way, Larry. 
That's a, that's a, a good thing you need to know when you're in business. A lesson well learned for Larry, I'll tell you. Larry would take that lesson from his father and apply it well. Eventually, Larry would become a successful businessman in his own right, being named vice president and general manager of Southern Glazers Wine and Spirits, one of the largest beverage distributors in Nevada. They were more than father-son. And uh, uh, they were friends. And as most fathers, they're mentors to their kids. Lou was Larry's mentor. He taught him the value of hard work, the value of money, the value of service. Yeah, there, there was more than just a father-son relationship there. If I had to characterize his relationship with his father and his mother, I think he worshiped them, which is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. And he was a good son. So I think it was the, the perfect kind of familial relationship that you would want if you were in a family. Larry and Lou had a very rare uh, relationship, father and son. Uh, I remember Lou, when I would talk to Lou, he was always telling me about Larry's next venture. He was very proud of his son, very proud. As time went by and Las Vegas grew, so too did the Venetian. The Ruvos bought a larger place, but still managed to retain the small Italian family kitchen feel. Business was booming, and life for the Ruvos couldn't be any better. And then, in the early 1990s, close family friend Charlie Silvestri started seeing some changes in the man he'd known for close to 40 years. The first thing I noticed, uh, I, I was belonged to the Las Vegas Country Club, and Larry and Louie and Angie moved to the club on the club. Well, we played golf several times, and I started to notice Lou doing strange things. In golf, you only tee up the golf ball on the tee box. We'd drive down the fairway, Lou would get out of his cart, put a tee in the fairway, and strike the ball. He wasn't, you know, I said, Some, something's screwy here. He's not doing this on purpose. I noticed those kinds of things. He began to be forgetful. And he was always prompt and always on top of everything. But that's when I first noticed it on the golf course when he started to do strange things. There's a story that he had a hole in one. Never remembered it. That's, that sure is a sign that <laughs> something's wrong. But for those closest to Lou, the people who had seen him every day, nothing seemed particularly amiss. If you went into the restaurant, my father, through the decades that seen these families grow up, he knew the kids' names, he knew what they liked, he knew, and friends of mine were saying, something's wrong with Lou. What's wrong with Lou, what do you mean? Well, I went in the other night. I usually liked this one table. He didn't put me in that table. He didn't know my kid's name. He didn't know. So I worked here. I lived here. And in between was the restaurant. So I saw my dad every day. Lou and I worked together uh, in the early stages. And uh, gradually, I saw his, uh, his decline, um, where he didn't recognize customers or his sentences didn't match, so you could actually see it happening. I didn't see anything until they brought it to my attention. And then sadly, I knew something was going on, but I didn't know what. Larry began taking Lou to doctors in the Las Vegas area, but a firm diagnosis remained elusive. The Ruvos would spend countless hours in doctor's office after doctor's office, undergoing test after test, hoping to hear something conclusive to be able to get Lou on the road to recovery. The local physician said he had a heart problem. So I took him down to the Texas Heart Institute to see a famed surgeon, Denton Cooley. We had, Denton I knew personally through a friend and he examined my father. He said, he has no heart problems. But Denton Cooley wasn't a 
a brain surgeon, he was a heart surgeon. He, his diagnosis was his heart was good and he was right. After over a year of doctors, tests and frustration, Larry discussed Lou's condition with a family friend that started the Ruvos down a road they never thought they'd travel. I was on vacation with a friend of mine, Dr. Bob Resnick, and I was telling him how frustrated. And he said, I think your father has Alzheimer's, it sounds like. And we have an expert, Dr. Leon Thal, at our facility. So I took my father down to UCSD. And in 45 minutes, Dr. Thal said your father has Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, a neurodegenerative disease that accounts for 60 to 80% of all dementia cases worldwide. Symptoms include memory loss, disorientation, the inability to care for oneself, and once the disease presents, the condition only worsens. There is no cure, and the disease is uniformly fatal. There are no Alzheimer's survivors. I was sad, I was shocked, I was disappointed, I was hoping it would be something that could be fixed or maybe a, a valve in his brain or I don't know what, but when I got that word I knew that I had to be, be planning uh, for the best care available to my father at that time and it did not exist in Las Vegas. The diagnosis hit Lou's friends and family like a bolt from the blue. You're going back almost 25 years now, and uh, I jokingly say we didn't even know how to pronounce Alzheimer's because uh, I grew up when it was senility, and Grandpa has senility or whatever. I didn't know how to take it. I didn't know what Alzheimer's was. Uh, I know it's... It's got its name from a doctor, I think, or something, but that's my first encounter of someone who didn't know their name or his wife's name or his son's name or his neighbor's names. I would hear him say, who is that? Well, he, they're probably lifelong friends. Maybe it was his brother-in-law. That's when I started to realize that this was something really serious. Larry immediately began lining up the best care possible for his father. However, in the early 90s, while doctors knew what Alzheimer's was and some basic methods for managing the disease, not much else was known about how to treat it or even what to look for. Another difficulty the Ruvos ran into was the fact that Las Vegas at the time was never really set up to provide much more than maintenance care for patients with Alzheimer's. For Larry, Getting the best care for his father meant repeating the same routine he went through attempting to find a diagnosis. The Ruvos became medical tourists, one of the thousands of Nevadans a year who sought care for degenerative brain diseases outside of Las Vegas. It was horrible, putting him on a plane, taking him down, then getting him in a car, and then going down there and taking them in and making sure, because they have all the right imaging equipment. We didn't even have the proper imaging equipment that was required for a definitive study on the brain at that time. We were able to do it, it was exhausting. Uh, it wasn't a day, you would go down for two days or if you had to drive down and then, you know, it was, it was discomforting uh, to my mother and it was a burden to our family, but you had to do it. I mean, when you love somebody, there is no such word as burden. You just, you just do it. The effort needed to get Lou the best care didn't just take a toll on the Ruvos personally, but it also impacted the Venetian as well. With Lou's health declining rapidly, he was no longer able to run the front of the restaurant as he had for over 40 years. Angie Ruvo attempted to run the kitchen and manage the dining room. But taking on both, in addition to helping care for Lou at home, proved too much for just one person. In an effort to save the Venetian, Larry reached out to family friend and Vegas hospitality veteran, Michael Severino. Larry asked me uh, to come in and run the restaurant and I had put it off, but I, I actually, the true, true story is I really didn't know that Lou was ill. When I did find out, that's when I just picked up the phone and called Larry, said, I'm in. 
And um, ironically, it was one of the best, I, I kiddingly say that Angie, Angie, but it's true, Angie taught me everything I had forgotten about the restaurant business. It enabled me to see guests, talk to people again, and reconnect, and it was, so, you know, out of something bad, something good came. With the Venetian getting the help it needed, the Ruvos were able to focus on Lou's care, but it quickly became clear that the home care he needed was far beyond what they could provide. Realizing that, Larry begins to look for an assisted living facility for Lou, hoping to provide a comfortable place for his father. It's during this time, Larry makes a fateful plea. I was flying back east, and there's a Catholic church on the, the strip called the Guardian Angel Cathedral. It's a holy day of obligation. I went to church, came out of the parking lot with my mom. And I said, Mom, just so you know, I can't find a house, a good quality care facility. And there's no place Dad would ever put you or me. I just lit a candle in the church that I pray God take him. And my mother looked at me and she says, I did too. On February 18, 1994, less than three years after his diagnosis, Las Vegas icon Lou Ruvo passes away. I called the doctor and I said, my dad's gone. He goes, well, he lost it. He thought he went out of the house and got lost. I said, no, no, he passed away. What? And then I told him about that two prayers that my mother and I said. And he said, Larry, I've heard that, but there was no medical reason your father should have passed away, none. So you're lucky your prayers were answered. And that 10, 12, 14 year horrible experience a lot of people have, we didn't have to go through this. It was a very short run it with this disease of two and a half years, which was way too long and hurt my mom. With Lou gone, Larry and his mother are left to pick up the pieces and attempt to move on. Alzheimer's is known as a disease that impacts the caregivers just as much as the person with the disease. During the course of Lou's treatment, his wife was the primary caregiver without much information of how to care for someone with Alzheimer's. When you were married to somebody for 50 years, they fall down, you pick them up. And we didn't know, we were very ignorant about caregiving. And I buried my father and then my, took my mother in for back surgery, knee surgery, and orthopedically she was a mess because she didn't know how to lift properly. She shouldn't have been lifting in the first place. Like most caregivers, she was sleep deprived, malnourished, uh, ate on the run and, and, and stressed and grieving. And while Angie underwent treatment and recovery, the Venetian, already managing without one of the power couple who put it on the map, saw Angie taken out of the equation as well. She had lost her purpose every day. And what was very difficult is she would go there in the morning and make the bread and the rolls and then she'd see her friends. It was her, it was her, it was her business life, it was her social life, it was everything. She was there seven days a week. Without Angie at the helm, the decision is made to sell the Venetian, which had become a touchstone to a different time in Vegas. Shortly thereafter, without the Ruvos guiding the restaurant, business declines and the Venetian closes its doors forever. It was a very sad, it was sad for those of us who could think and still cherish the memories of the family and the food and the ambiance and the feeling that everybody who went there and people are far and wide across this country that ate at the Venetian and knew Angie and Lou. It was an end of a time. Las Vegas was small. Of course, by the time the Venetian closed, we were now two or three or 400,000 people. But that, that restaurant represents a time in Las Vegas that many people consider to be the best time of Las Vegas. And the closing, I think, ended that 
small town atmosphere. For most families, this would be where the story ends. A husband and father gone, a business ended, Angie in retirement and Larry managing his enterprises. But for the Ruvos, one phone call from a friend ended up continuing the story and launching something none of them could ever have dreamed of. A friend of mine called me up and said, you know, Lou's going to be gone February 18th, 1995. Your dad will be gone a year. Let's have a, a Lou Ruvo dinner and tell Lou Ruvo stories because your dad loved to have good food and good wine. Let's do that. The dinner was held at Spago's, the Wolfgang Puck restaurant then located inside Caesar's Palace. The Ruvos and a few close friends and associates are in a private room remembering Lou when in walks Jean-Paul de Joria, founder of Paul Mitchell, and something quite unexpected happens. Jean-Paul walks in and he goes, what's this about? I says, well, my dad's gone a year. We're just, we're just telling Lou Ruvo stories and celebrating his life. He says, Lou died of Alzheimer's. I said, yeah, and he says, here's $5,000. And everybody stood up. We had $35,000 at the end of the night. And uh, I looked at Wolfgang and I said, we have to do a real dinner. And just like that, Larry Ruvo, entrepreneur, became Larry Ruvo fundraiser. The $35,000 raised that first night would become the seed money for Keep Memory Alive, a nonprofit corporation founded in honor of Lou Ruvo. Keep Memory Alive's goal is raising money to increase awareness of and to research, treat, and manage a whole host of degenerative brain diseases. By 1998, Keep Memory Alive had managed to raise a substantial amount of cash. So Larry Ruvo took a trip to California to see Dr. Leon Thal, the doctor who had treated his father, checkbook in hand, ready to pour a substantial amount of money into Dr. Thal's operation at the University of California, San Diego. I says, Leon, I've got $35 million. I'm gonna give this to you. I'd like to put my dad's name on a building in memory and to say thank you. And he goes, if you give me 35 million, by the time it filters down to me, I'm gonna get about 19. And it'll be the biggest disservice to Las Vegas because this coming tsunami of Alzheimer's and brain health. People in Las Vegas don't have the ability all the time to fly down here, drive down here, and get health care. You need to do something in Las Vegas. At which point I said, I don't know anything about this, but I know you do. So if I were to raise the funds, you would have to come and run it. He had just got a huge grant from the federal government back then, 50, 50 some odd million dollars, he says, I couldn't come for five years. I said, it'll take me two to, two to three to design it and build it. You'll give me some intern people, then you'll come. The fact that, in a few short years, Larry Ruvo had gone from entrepreneur to fundraiser to standing on the brink of building a clinic in Las Vegas didn't seem out of the ordinary to those who knew him. I was not surprised. When Larry puts his mind to something, it's going to get done. When it came to building a clinic, it wasn't as simple as just putting a building in and filling it with doctors and staff. Larry Ruva wanted to have something that would be uniquely Vegas. But as he searched for someone who would bring some Vegas flair to his venture, he soon found the person he had targeted to design the building, world-renowned architect Frank Geary, didn't exactly have the same enthusiasm for Vegas that he did. I wanted a star architect, celebrity architect, and there was several that I was talking to, but he was my first choice, and I, through my a friend of mine, had worked for him, my architect uh, that built my home, had worked for him 30 years ago. So I call Mark Appleton, and Mark Appleton calls Frank, and uh, Frank barely remembered Mark, but he didn't know me at all, and Mark got me an appointment. And we went down, and uh, as soon as I walked in, Frank, Never got up, never went to shake my hand, he just said, I'm not building a building in Las Vegas. That was the opening salvo. What? 
what would you say? He says, I'm not building a building in Las Vegas. I said, well, and we're on the air, so I won't use the profanity that evolved in the next few minutes discussion, but I said, basically, you must be the rudest, nastiest human being I ever met in my life. I flew down here, you're not even gonna hear my pitch. I got 45 minutes, I want the 45 minutes. He said, sit down. As the meeting wound down and Larry made his pitch, Geary remained unconvinced. And Frank said, I, I gotta think about it. You know, Las Vegas, everything's been done. You got pyramids, you got castles, you got volcanoes. I gotta think about this. Give me two weeks. So now I figured I'd bring my secret weapon, which is my wife, Camille. So Camille and I fly back down. We're talking to Frank. And then Frank said to my wife, he goes, did you ever make mud pies when you were young? Sure. Well, you never made mud pies with other than your friends. I like your husband. I like his story. I'm going to do this building. And I'm going to be the mouse that roared. You're not giving me a big, 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 big building to build here. It's not the Guggenheim, but I'm gonna do something very special. And boy, did he ever. The building Geary designed would turn out to be a marvel of engineering. The building would be fabricated in China and then sent to Las Vegas in 555 different pieces, no two of them alike. Over that structure would be over 32,000 pieces of stainless steel and 199 windows. Each piece was constructed with such a low tolerance for error that every one was to be digitally tagged and placed using GPS assistance. When city officials got wind of exactly the design and scope of what the clinic was going to look like, it was something they knew they'd want as part of an ongoing revitalization effort for an underdeveloped part of town. I went to Larry and uh, we were friends and our friends, of course. Uh, and I said to him, Larry, I need a favor. And you know, Larry, anything. That's the way he says, anything. So I said, well, don't say it so fast. I said that um, uh, I hear you're going to build this memorial, basically, for your dad. And I would like that building to be the cornerstone or the keystone of what we're trying to establish in downtown Las Vegas on our 61 acres. And he said, Oscar, I have a piece of land right next to Southern Wine and Spirits out of Jones and 215. It's already been set aside. He said, Oscar, I have these great plans that were done by a local architect, beautiful plans, and it's a go. When he said he was going to take it south of the, of the city and down the strip, Oscar said, oh my gosh, no, you can't do that. And so there we were, and Larry said, well, let's see what you're planning on. I said, Larry, I'm telling you, I, I really need this. This is going to define, uh, I don't like to talk in terms of legacies, but this is going to define the downtown. And for some reason, he did it. He uh, moved uh, the project from out there to downtown. With the building designed and about to begin construction, and on the verge of announcing the clinic would be run in cooperation with the Ohio-based Cleveland Clinic, the project is dealt a serious blow. Dr. Leon Thal is killed when the small airplane he is piloting crashes, leaving the clinic leaderless and Larry scrambling to find a replacement. With the sudden passing of, of Dr. Thal, I basically used the line so many times, but I said to Toby Cosgrove, I said, You're getting, I'm giving you Yankee Stadium, I want Babe Ruth. Who's Babe Ruth? I said, Jeff Cummings. He said, you'll never get him. Well, I remember very well being at a meeting in Washington, D.C., and my cell phone goes off, uh, and on the other end of the line is Larry Ruvo. And Larry says, you know, I've built Yankee Stadium, and I've got to have Babe Ruth, and you're Babe Ruth, and I want you to come to the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health in Las Vegas, Nevada. He's fully tenured at UCLA. He's got to leave a 20-year tenured position to come to the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health for a one-year letter of engagement and give up all that safety and security. And at that point, I was aware that the, the center was, was evolving, but I had very few details. Uh, and so 
I paid a visit, we had discussions with Cleveland Clinic and with Larry. It was clear it was an exciting new enterprise, lots of momentum, lots of innovation, lots of new ideas that were all being brought together, architectural ideas, scientific ideas, patient care ideas, caregiver ideas, all of these things brought together in an exciting package that I wanted to be part of. With the team in place, the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health opened its doors to patients on July 13, 2009. The clinic chooses to focus on providing not only a high quality of patient care, but a much different experience for the patients and the caregivers. For instance, the clinic is designed without any traditional waiting rooms, a decision based on the Ruvo's experience getting treatment for Lou. We walked into that room, the waiting room, and there was three people, one in a wheelchair, one in diapers, and the other guy couldn't keep his head up. And my father said, this why I'm here? It's no dead, they see a myriad of diseases here. This is not why you're here. And I knew I lied to my dad and I said it numerous times. It scarred me that I did that, but I had to because I didn't want him to know what was coming. And I didn't know what was coming at the moment. We believe that coming to a clinic should be a hospitality experience, that, that the caregiver's experience should be very positive, that the patient experience should be very positive. Part of the hospitality experience comes when patients in the clinic bypass the normal waiting room process. Instead of walking in and going to where their appointment is, every patient is met at the door by a volunteer like Anne Marie Martin and Jean Georges. The volunteers will then escort them to their appointment and help them check in before going back and seeing their medical team. The volunteers aren't just there to get people to their rooms. It's all part of setting the patient up for the most productive visit possible. I have had a couple of doctors express to me uh, when I have said to them, thank you for loving these patients. They're always so happy when they come down. And the doctors have said, thank you for putting, in that, putting them in that mood when they come out to see us. Because if they're not happy when they come down, it's our fault. Because you have sent them up happy. So we want them to go down happy. So I think it does make a difference. They're not frightened. They're not intimidated. They're not worried. It's a very comfortable experience. For Jean and Anne Marie, Volunteering at the clinic is a personal experience. Both of them have had close family members treated at the facility, and they've seen firsthand what kind of a difference the patient and caregiver experience at the clinic can make. I love being here because of Mr. Ruvo's philosophy on taking care of our patients. Because I'm a patient, you're a patient, somewhere in this city we're patients. And when you walk in a doctor's office, you don't want to be ignored. When you walk in a facility, you want somebody to recognize you and to treat you with dignity, respect, and care. And that's what we do here. We publish a magazine and we tell all of our patients and families and caregivers about where the disease is and there's interviews. And one of our caregivers said, I bring my loved one to the center but it's almost like going to a spa. She equated her experience at a medical facility like going to a spa. And that's what I think, or that's what I know I wanted to achieve, was the ability for people to be treated with dignity, even though they may be terminally ill. Why can't they have some dignity for them and their loved ones. If the volunteers aren't getting patients directly to doctors, they're helping them to one of the busiest treatment locations within the clinic, the physical therapy department. When people think of degenerative brain diseases, they think of memory loss or the inability to think. But those are typically symptoms that present further on in the disease's development. Evidence has recently shown us that up to three to nine years before 
people have dementia, they're seeing their walk change. They're becoming less stable. They're becoming more risk for falling. And so what we do here with those people is identify areas where they are tending to have more susceptibility to falling that might decrease their quality of life and minimize their ability to move like they'd like to and really make sure that we target areas and protect them from having changes in their life that we all don't want to have. We want to be able to do the things we like to do as long as possible. The physical therapy, however, is more than just enabling people to continue to do the things they love. Studies have shown that exercise and movement are key components to prolonging brain function in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. In the treatment of patients, one of the things we talked about was uh, in helping the brain be more resilient. It turns out that one of the things we can do that's most helpful is exercise. Most patients haven't thought too much about you know, how to put exercise in their daily living. Because if they are not active and they are not getting their, their circulation going, they're not getting as much blood or nutrition to their brain. That's number one. Also, we're putting them through tasks. We're, we're making them think. We're also incorporating thinking tasks with physical tasks which simulates our daily life. We walk and talk. We are doing often two things at one time. And people with memory impairments really have less ability to do that. And so our therapy specifically focuses on getting their brain thinking while their body's moving. The physical therapists are key players in managing the disease itself as they're in frequent and prolonged contact with patients. Physical therapists not only interact with patients during treatment sessions, but are in a position to gather and pass information back to doctors and the rest of the medical team and to patients' caregivers. One reason I love being a physical therapist is because we get time, one-on-one -on -one time with them and usually regularly scheduled time to develop those relationships with our patients that even doctors aren't able to have. So we see our patients, which is actually pretty uncharacteristic, especially in this community, one-on-one -on -one for 60 minutes every time they come. And they're coming at least once to twice a week. So we develop a great relationship with them. They really let us know their struggles at home and we help them problem solve those situations, whether it may seem small to them that they never mentioned at the doctors or something that just didn't come up in that visit. We're really able to see it, talk with the caregivers over that period of time. The Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health is more than just a treatment facility for those with degenerative brain diseases. It's also on the leading edge of the research effort to combat debilitating brain diseases. Through their partnership with the Cleveland Clinic and close cooperation with pharmaceutical companies and the National Institute of Health, the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health has conducted more than 70 clinical trials. So we have two types of trials. We have the, the trials that are drug-based, where we're, we're recruiting people and we're testing a drug to see if it's beneficial. And then we're also doing discovery trials in terms of trying to just observe changes in the brain in terms of neuroimaging, cognitive functioning through psychological testing, even physical therapy assessments. And those are observational and what we, what we learn from those studies will later inform the drug trials. One of the individuals going through trials at the clinic is Nancy Nelson. When I was diagnosed in 2013 with early onset Alzheimer's, I decided I had to make a decision was I going to take the drugs that at the time that they asked me to take, or was I going to make a different decision? Nancy made the decision to participate in a five-year observational study. Researchers began her portion of the study by taking an image of her brain using PET and MRI scans. And then they will conduct follow-up MRI scans at one-year intervals to see how the disease is impacting her brain structurally and what, if any, reduction in cognitive ability stems from that change. We have to, we have to know about this disease. My dad died in 2002. Um, literally, you heard nothing back in 2002. So we've gained a lot of ground. We have to keep gaining. And we have to just say that, that it's OK. And if whatever one you find that is OK for you to do, we're grateful for the research and the help. With nearly six million individuals in the United States alone with Alzheimer's, 
one would think there would be people with a personal stake in the fight against brain-degrading diseases signing up in droves. However, the clinic's largest roadblock to conducting clinical trials is simply finding people who want to volunteer for research. Some are worried that test subjects are nothing more than lab rats. Many simply don't know the opportunity exists, whether they are cognitively normal or have brain disease, to participate in research in Las Vegas. The Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health strives daily to make strides on both fronts. We're participating in many initiatives, both large at the national level and small at the local level, that are aimed at improving clinical trial participation and helping people to understand how exciting trials are, that they, they personally can help solve the diseases that they have and that may afflict their children because many of these diseases have a hereditary influence in them. So we're trying to move away from this idea that you're a guinea pig and move towards the idea that you are an essential element in the discovery process. And scientists cannot develop new drugs without an alliance with patients and caregivers. So we're trying to see that we can build an army of people who can defeat the enemy of brain disease, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. That's a goal Nancy agrees with wholeheartedly. I would say jump in the water's fine. I would say that we need to help one another and we all have specifics that we will do and not do. So the non-pharmaceutical is a deal breaker for me if I, if it's, you know, if you need to do that. Um, but for other people it may not be and you're helping, the statistics prove this is just going out of the world here in, in how many people are going to have it. Researching a cure for Alzheimer's and diseases like it is far from easy. Even with all of the minds assembled at the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health and all of the researchers combined around the globe, clinical research studies have an extremely high rate of failure. Over 99% of studies don't get the desired outcome. We learn from each failure as well. We, we learn new things from the trial. So it could be trial design that maybe we didn't test people at the right appropriate duration or that it's not the right drug or it's not the right dose. So even though we have had a lot of negative trials, you can still learn a lot from the trial. We're continuously changing the odds very slowly as we understand why the various drugs that we use have, have failed. There, there is going to be a cure. Uh, and uh, it certainly, it cer that certainly won't happen if we say, what, why bother? For the staff at the clinic, not only are they trying to find a cure, but they are also constantly trying to bring that rate of failure down through new techniques they are pioneering in their own studies. We've tried to think about what is the best way to get new drugs to our patients as fast as possible. Uh, and one problem with the development of new drugs has been the lack of of information about whether or not they're having the actual brain effect that we're anticipating. And so we've developed several new approaches using magnetic resonance imaging or MRI uh, to capture at a very sensitive way uh, the of impact of drugs on the brain. And this is an innovation which has come specifically from the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health. The team leading the charge in the effort to develop new imaging techniques are people you wouldn't think of finding in a hospital. Mathematicians. Imaging machines like an MRI or PET scan are only as good as what the users tell the machines to look for. So the clinic's team of mathematicians spend their day squirreled away in a room, trying to devise new ways to find signs of changes in the brain known as biomarkers. You can look at structural imaging or functional imaging. For example, if you look at structure of the brain, you can say the volume of a certain region in the brain, you know, it's changing, it's different in people, that is a biomarker. And for um, another biomarker could be um, a cortical thickness or how thick your cortex is. So it varies um, in, in, in disorders, aging, young, and so that's another biomarker that you can see. In function, there's always functional connectivity. Then you have, uh, you know, various other biomarkers for all other imaging modalities. Because so little is known about how the brain actually works and functions, the team's work is slow and very, very incremental. Well, I wish I have aha moments like Einstein, but um, usually it's uh, a lot of um, ba building off of what people have already done. So, you know, we, and we've got this amazing team here and they all are 
you know, brilliant in their own aspects. And uh, so someone, you know, we come across a paper, kind of a publication, and then we start discussing how do we apply to the population or the data that we have, and then someone, it's, it's always a discussion. We're like a, we're in the same room. We're talking all the time. There's a lot of communication. And then we also have uh, Dr. Cordes, who's the director of the Neuroimaging Group. I mean, he's uh, also always there in the discussions. And, you know, there's always this freedom for us to kind of experiment and see where it's going. One of the things that sets the Lou Ruvo Center for Brain Health apart from other medical facilities is the close environment in which the different divisions of the clinic cooperate and collaborate in. The physical therapists, the doctors, the mathematicians, and others in the clinic work in such close proximity to each other that it sparks innovation, which is Dr. Cummings' goal in every facet of operations. We've tried to capture innovation in everything we do. You walk into a Frank Geary building that looks unlike any other building in Las Vegas and maybe any other building in the United States. And if you're not thinking out of the box, you are betraying the spirit of this building. So we believe that we should be innovative in our clinical care, in our approach to caregivers, and particularly in our science. And I believe that the application of advanced mathematics to brain, brain imaging analysis, uh, that the uh, that the integration of uh, more and more advanced technology into our clinical trials and a very disciplined approach to clinical trials has made us a leader in those two areas of science in the United States and the world. The sense of innovation goes far beyond what is happening in the clinic. It is also changing the optics of how Las Vegas is viewed on the world stage, not just as a place for entertainment, but a place to look to find out what the bleeding edge of brain research is. Ironic when you consider Lou Ruvo himself and the Venetian restaurant were a holdover from a different time in Las Vegas's history. Las Vegas, believe it or not, has become the focus of the entire world. Um, our name is known everywhere and it's a place of excitement and it's great cuisine, and it's getting to be known as so much more than that. So I have people coming in from everywhere, and that's one of the first pieces I show them. But at the end of the day, the story all boils down to one man, Lou Ruvo, a restaurant, and how a father and his son's relationship launched an effort to combat degenerative brain diseases and ensure one day no other families would have to go through what the Ruvos did. I mean, it's, it's, it's standing out in that lobby and watching caregivers and, and the interaction of patients and families uh, get, being given the proper diagnosis, being given the uh, proper care for caregivers. I think my father, I know my father, uh, somebody who said, you know, if Lou hadn't passed away, none of this would have happened. And they're right. But I also know that if my father had a chance to come back and not, and reverse everything, he wouldn't have done it. He wasn't selfish, and I think that if he knew that his death uh, would turn lemons into lemonade, which it has. He was, he'd stay where he is. This is beyond any dream I ever had.
This documentary is made possible by these supporters. Erwin Kishner, whose impact on public service television and brain-related research will never be forgotten. The Lynn Ruffin Smith Charitable Foundation is proud to support resources available for care providers and patients suffering from neurological diseases. Martin A. Gold, who has a continuing desire to increase community awareness of the progress in medical research.